Are you in midlife and in that horrible moment of saying, how do I date now? I'm divorced, I'm alone, and it's this time of life. What are the rules? What do I do? How do I not make mistakes? Today's guest, Jonathan Asley, is going to answer those questions for you. He's the author of What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? And we're going to have a great talk, so stay tuned. Welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. If you're ready to increase your confidence in conversations and conflict, deepen your self-awareness, expand your connectedness, and enrich your relationship with yourself and other humans you care about, and even those you wish you didn't, you're in the right place. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the program, and I'm so glad you're back. If you're a returning listener, welcome, welcome, welcome. And if you're new, we're so glad you found us. Here we're going to give you emotional savvy ideas about how you can have the best relationship with yourself and others possible. And my guest today is right along those lines, because what if you happen to find yourself alone, single, in midlife, maybe unexpectedly, and you're saying, what can I do about dating? How should I think about this? What's possible? So welcome to the program, Jonathan. Well, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaler. Uh, you're so welcome. I'm excited about this because I know that there are many people, you know, my specialty is helping the partners, exes, and adult children of those relentlessly difficult, toxic people that I trademark the term hijackles for mm. and many times they finally find themselves in midlife alone they haven't dated for 20 years they're wondering how do i do this am i safe to do this what is possible so we're going to have a great talk about that and let me tell everybody a little bit about you i'm going to read your bio so i get it all right <laughs> So this is Jonathan Asley, and the focus of America's leading midlife dating coach has expanded into deeper essential philosophy of what it truly means to love. After losing his 19-year-old son Connor in 2018, Jonathan's grief led him on a soul-searching inner journey where he became aware of an often overlooked dimension of the dating conversation. That piques your interest, doesn't it? So today he's on a mission of encouraging both men and women to fully love themselves with that new book I mentioned, What the Heck is Self-Love? Anyway, we're going to have a good talk about that because it's not my favorite term. Um, and it's packed with fun, engaging spiritual and personal growth practices and his dynamic midlife love mastery mentorship that inspires hundreds of people daily around the world. So there's why you should be listening to Jonathan Asley. And now we're going to really get into the nitty gritty of it all. So Jonathan, I want to ask you right off the top, what inspired you to focus on dating at midlife? And I think I have a clue, but go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you for asking. Well, um, after turning 40 and going through a divorce some years back, uh, I found myself back out in the dating realm single. And at that time, the internet dating was just becoming popular. And I thought, oh, I'm, I've, I've ended this relationship. I need to fill this hole, so to speak, this hole in myself. Let me just go on the internet and find someone. And sure enough, I met a nice person. We had a nice date and something wasn't right. And then a couple of days later, I'd meet another person, went on a date, nice person, something wasn't right. This happened over and over again. And in the course of one year, I had over a hundred internet dates. Whoa, you yeah. were a busy boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what I realized that that something wasn't right was me. So I actually began studying and reading about relationships. I started to buy the books that mostly women bought. I was buying, you know, buying those books to learn about how to be in a better relationship, how to show up differently. And then as I began even doing more exploration, I realized that the reason why I wasn't showing up was, you know, fully engaged in this process and was continually met with one disappointment after another 
was I hadn't healed my childhood wounds and I hadn't really healed past the, I don't want to say failed marriage, but a marriage that ended. So I began a deep dive into personal development, self-help and spirituality all the while dating. <laughs> and, and through my dating process, I was talking to so many different women, not actually meeting, just talking to them, instant messaging. Uh, I mean, talking on the phone, instant messaging and that sort of thing. And through that process, I kind of lean, you know, was weaning out of my professional life in the insurance realm and following a passion that I had no idea was gonna be landing into in the dating and relationship realm. Well, that makes sense. How did you become interested in this? A desperate need <laughs> to find out how to do it well. Yeah. And that's often the impetus for people who dive deeply and help other people. So I mentioned earlier that self-love is not my favorite word. <laughs> and it's not because I don't believe that we need to have some. I just believe that it's it's become one of those words that we just miss. You know, people say, well, you need self-love and somebody doesn't even hear it anymore. So mm -hmm. I was interested to read your book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? Um, and find that you had a definition I could get behind. So would you share that with us? Well, what's interesting is when I think of the word love in and of itself, it's such a powerful word. And it's that space of both, you know, we oftentimes focus on giving love and and as human beings and how do we turn that around inward? So when I think of the word love, I also think of the word self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-reliance wrapped up into the most beautiful word on the planet, which is the word love. So that redirection of love back inward. And I, I often say much like when you're getting on an airplane and the flight attendant tells you in the case of cabin pressure change, you know, oxygen mask will drop. And if you're traveling with children, put the mask on yourself first. That mask is the oxygen of love. And that's why I know the word self-love is a turnoff to a lot of people or it's woo-woo to a lot of people. Um, I think it's the most appropriate word because loving on oneself is oftentimes the most difficult thing to do. So embrace the word love is my encouragement because of the power of that word that nobody can describe actually <laughs> mm -hmm. so in the book you say that the definition is our capacity to feed our spirit fill our love cup and find inner peace yeah and so that's why i like the definition <laughs> <laughs> to um have our capacity to feed our spirit fill our love cup and feel inner peace yeah so let's dive into this whole thing of midlife dating because there's a lot of whoa I'm not so sure breaks on should i do it should i not do it how do i get myself to do it and when i do it am i safe so tell me what makes midlife dating different from other times earlier or later in your life sure that's a great question well let's think about this for a second and and i'm going to share with you that roughly about 75% of people over 45 years old who are actively you know, in the market to seek a new relationship are divorced. Mm -hmm. So when you think about when we were in our 20s and 30s, uh, those who are single and looking for love, you're literally playing in a field of everybody else has never been married. So there's a vast difference right off the bat. Also, most people in their 20s and 30s are if they're seeking a mate, they're doing it, they're marriage minded, they're seeking to start a family. In midlife, you, many of, most everyone already has a family. So the dynamics between a 20 and 30 year old is vastly different than that 45, 50 or 60 year old person. Um, that's just to name a few, because when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're kind of like a blank sheet of paper. Your life is just being written in your 40s, 50s and 60s. There's a lot of stuff on that sheet of paper and, and some people call it baggage. I like to call it luggage. For some people, they're carrying more luggage than others. Um, and so there's a lot of different nuances in the dating realm that doesn't exist in the 20s and 30s. And by the time people get into the 70s and 80s, they operate from a completely different perspective. They're oftentimes seeking companionship and connection and their egoic mind 
isn't actively running the show. Whereas in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, ego can substantially affect the process of, because of expectations and, and traditional and societal expectations as well. So that's why I come in to help navigate um, because I've been through the experience of divorce. I have children. I've gone through alimony, child support, visitation rights, which people in their 20s don't necessarily you know, have any awareness around. And by the time you get to 70, 80, you don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different thing I'm, um, at both ends of the spectrum. Um, what do we do about the fear, Jonathan? What do we do about somebody who says, oh, I'm being a lurker on a few places, not ready to put my foot in? How can you allay somebody's fear? Well, I think like any fear, you know, or, you know, when you're feeling uncomfortable with something, well, first off, when you're, when someone's doing something brand new, it's natural to feel uncomfortable. So, you know, the old phrase going outside of your comfort zone is how we achieve success. Uh, it's the same in the dating realm and, and dating and relationships or sometimes love can feel, feel really scary. Um, I'm going to say a very simple thing to that. Love is a big risk, and it's still the best game in town. <laughs> okay, so let me ask the flip side of that question. Yeah. What are the red flags we have to be aware of in dating at midlife? What do you think the top ones are? Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you said top ones, because literally we'd have to do eight hours of shows to get through <laughs> this. Um, certainly in midlife is, is someone uh, in a place that they want to be in a fully committed relationship. So um, many people are coming, especially in the divorce realm, they're coming out of a, a marriage or a past relationship, and they're not really ready to pursue a new relationship. So one of the red flags is, when I say red, and when I think of red flags, I think ask good questions. So. Um, one of the questions would be to how long was you, how long ago was your last significant relationship? Um, well, let me ask a question right there. Sure. Speaking of asking questions, I'd like to hear as you say these things, when in a new beginning do you ask these questions in your opinion? So I'm a big proponent of asking early rather than later. Most of my contemporaries uh, adopted the philosophy is let keep things light, keep things casual, allow romance to run the show. And I'm the complete opposite. You want to interrogate someone before a date. Now, I'm saying that with tongue in cheek, okay? <laughs> uh, but what I mean is ask really good questions of someone. Um, one question to ask someone is, is there anybody that thinks they're in a relationship with you right now? <laughs> You know, instead of asking someone, are they in a relationship with someone, ask them if they think anyone else thinks they're in a relationship with you. I good think that's question. a great question to yeah. ask. Yes, because in this very fluid world of dating, yeah, there could be people that just because you have been chatting with them think you're dating. There may be someone that you went out with once or twice and had a good time and they now think that you're on a path to the altar. I mean, all kinds of things could be happening. So what would be the red flag then that's a good question to ask but what would be a question coming at a person who might have to see that as a red flag i'm, I'm a little unclear of that so when you're saying i apologize i'm a little unclear on that okay well you're you go on this first date or you're yeah. chatting with somebody and what it, what red flag question might you be asked that tells you that, whoa, what's up with that person? Well, okay, so it's more not so much the questions they ask, but it's oftentimes what are they talking about? So, for example, it's not uncommon that people go out on first dates and they're talking about a past relationship or maybe in the interaction with someone, maybe you're asking them a question about their marriage. They talk negatively about their ex-partner that's those are usually the two top things they're either talking a lot about an ex-partner or they're talking negative about an ex-partner those are both red flags one maybe they're still in love with their ex-partner or b they are blaming their ex-partner for everything and they've taken no personal responsibility for their part in the ending of the relationship those are probably the two 
most significant things that happen most frequently in midlife relationships or dating. You know, I would certainly agree with you because this whole thing that you brought up, you know, some of your colleagues believe differently. Um, I happen to be of that school that says go out three or four times before you be and find out if you even like the person, if you can have fun, if you have things in common before you ask really deep questions, because they may just bring it up and you don't have to interrogate, as you say. Um, well, I said it tongue in cheek. <laughs> I know. But, you know, some people feel that, like, I've got my checklist. Um, how many times have you been married? What happened in each time? What do you think about women? How do you feel women should be treated? Is there equality? And they go down and checklist like that and pretty soon the person on the other end male or female whatever relationship they're looking for is going whoa right so w there's a happy medium in here obviously but you think it's good to get to the meat of things in the beginning yeah why do you think that in in opposition to other people Be well, it brings it back to my book. You know, the vast majority of people are are not loving on themselves. And what I mean to say, in a place of real self-confidence, they're in their sovereignty, they're in that place of inner peace. And what happens in the dating process, it triggers oftentimes, I'm not good enough. Because here's what happens. They dated four times. It's all casual, lovey-dovey. And then you become attached to another human being. And the minute you become attached to another human being, oftentimes you forego what would be a no, <laughs> a red flag, because you've already become attached to someone. So one of the reasons why I'm a big advocate for asking good questions in the beginning, and it actually, the first phone call can be the first date. You can actually ask, not again, it's conversational, not confrontational. It's asking questions just to get a sense of the person. Mm -hmm. Here's the delicate balance, because while I'm agreeing with you in the sense that it would be nice it to be light and casual, and it takes roughly about 100 hours to truly get to know another human being. Think about it. It takes To really get to know another human being, it takes some time, both virtual and you know face-to-face. -face. You spend 100 hours with someone, you become incredibly attached. You might have even been intimate at that point. And if you haven't asked really good questions in advance to determine if you share the same values, if you have compatible lifestyles, and really the hardest thing to determine is emotional maturity, you might be setting yourself up for a very contentious ending of a relationship that you might have been able to forego. Because I will tell you, <laughs> Roberta, almost everyone who ends a relationship says the exact same thing. I knew in the first week something was off, but I went against my better judgment. Oh, I agree with that. So, <laughs> you know, so this is where I, as a coach, I help navigate that question answering period with my clients so they don't have an emotional distressful dynamic that happens at the ending of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So are there any questions to be avoided in the early dates? Um, you know, I'm more of a proponent of go with what feel, you know, operate by being who you are. And I, I don't necessarily think you should avoid anything. I mean, I could, I could probably come up with a list of things. You know, maybe it's too soon to tell certain things about yourself that's secret and private. I don't think that would be appropriate until you've actually built trust with someone. But sharing a bit about your life that is not a secret, if you will, I think nothing's off the table from that perspective. And when I use the word secret, I mean private and confidential, you know, mm -hmm. that maybe takes time to, to share with someone. Yes, I think things go in layers, don't they? I mean, yeah. you, you disclose a little bit, you see if you're wise, you disclose a little bit and then you see how it's received. Yes. Did the other person actually hear you? Were they interested in hearing you? Or did they immediately come back with an allaboutme.com statement? 
right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a way to find out what's going on. I mean, I work with couples all over the world, and I work with people particularly, as I said earlier, who have come out of a relationship where there's been a lot of damage and have really damaged self-esteem and have 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 them thinking that maybe their picker is just off you know yeah. they're they're afraid so i think it goes in layers you 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 lay something down and you see how it's received and then if it's received well equitably i always say jonathan that there are three hallmarks of healthy relationships any relationship anywhere and that's equality reciprocity and mutuality mm. and if those three things aren't present you can find out just by these conversations often to say how was something i said received but if we're in the how do you like me so far part yeah we don't we don't calibrate that and that's i think where things can go terribly wrong in the first few dates and will lead you to 120 hours 100 of which you wish you hadn't spent because <laughs> you were refused to calibrate the answers you were leaning in too far you were more concerned that they would like you that you could find someone than to think about it and this is what i tell my clients jonathan yeah. think about it as an audition you're auditioning the person for spending more time with you, for having some space on your internal hard drive. Um, would this be okay? And when you do that, you create some space that is a good boundary for you to have time to calibrate what they said. You know, you're not rushing somewhere. And going back to your point about self-love, so well taken in that yeah. in your definition, because if you are not really clear who you are, what your values are, what your vision for your life is, what your beliefs about everything are, including relationships, and what your next best steps are, you're not ready to have a relationship because you're highly likely to hitch your wagon to somebody else's dreams. You know, it's interesting. I, I coach women in particular, and one of their frustrations that come to me about men centers around commitment. And, and I'm going to uh, piggyback on what you just said with this illustration. So I'll go, um, they go, Jonathan, you know, I'm in this relationship and I, and I, you know, I'm in a relationship and I want more commitment. And I ask them, okay, great. What does that look like to you? Well, Jonathan, I just want more commitment from him. I'm like, great. What does that look like for you? But Jonathan, I just want more commitment from him. Great. What does that look like for you? So really to piggyback on what you just said, clarity in one's own desires is, it seems to be incredibly lacking. In fact, one of the things I do as a coach is help uh, every client get clarity on what they want because what's also interesting at midlife is not everybody wants to get remarried or live with someone. So the definition of commitment today is very skewed. And in fact, in my private mentorship group, we had a discussion about this. And that related to sex, and you know the and I'm, I, the thing. This is such a tricky one because so many people say you need commitment before sex. Well, commitment's a big word, and it can encompass a lot of different things. Does that mean we're going to share, you know, our bank accounts together? Does that mean we're going to share a home together? What does commitment mean? So I help my clients redefine it in the in the area of both exclusivity and monogamy. Right. as being the important factors before entering into a sexual relationship. And what I mean to simply say is find out, hey, if we're going to be together intimate, are we going to be exclusive with each other on an intimate level and monogamous? And are we also going to agree that there's not going to be dating of any other people in this? Because that's really the first layer of commitments. Right. I but agree th with there's that. this misconception about commitment. And here's what happens with a lot of women in particular. They talk about, remember you said like maybe what's taboo. <laughs> they talk about commitment when they really just mean exclusivity and monogamy. And to them, to the man that scares them off because what we think of commitment is like full-blown marriage. And what you're just thinking is, hey, I just want to make sure you're not dating anyone else and sleeping with anyone else. And that's really where the conversation should start in that particular realm. And let me put a big caveat in here because it just came up in one of my groups the other day. And the person asked a question and they said, this, uh, I'm dating a new person and um, 
I wanted, they wanted to be exclusive. And then as soon as I said, yes, we can be exclusive, then it was a man who was writing to me. And the mm. woman said, you know, exclusivity is he wanted it. You know, he asked that question wisely that you just were talking about. Yeah. And she said, yes, yes. And then a week later, she said, but I'm going on a prearranged tra uh, trip with my ex because everything is already paid for next week. Okay. And, you know, it brought up this because of my work with hijackals, all these toxic mm. people, because yeah. what a hijackal likes to do, Jonathan, is they want to pin you down as quickly as possible. They, they'll they say things like, oh, I hardly know you, but I love you. I know that we're meant to be together. I know we're going to get married. You know, I can hardly wait to have kids with you. I mean, they're in it to win it as fast and as effortlessly as possible. Then they want to capture you into exclusivity while they go off and do whatever they darn well please. And so I said this, he, you know, he asked me, he said, do you think this is a red flag? Could this be a hijackal? And I said, whoa, really good question. Well, I know from the male perspective, we oftentimes futurize, or I call it trying on for size. So when we meet someone we like, if our testosterone and, and dopamine are kind of, you know, an oxytocin even in, can happen within or happens within men, we can actually begin to futurize and or try it on for size, talk about the future. Mm -hmm. And going back to that 100 hours we're, that I'm talking about, it takes about 100 hours to build enough of a friendship that has begins to develop the root, roots that can sustain a, a long-term relationship. So if that's happening early on, I actually think that's more of, an, more of a dynamic that happens from the perspective of, we're excited, we're enthusiastic. It's not meant to intentionally hurt another human being. It's just, that's what happens when one individual gets excited or enthusiastic about someone because it's natural to want to futurize. Now this typically happens more with men or women. It's one of the reasons why I didn't <laughs> coin the phrase. Else? <laughs> well, well, there could be, well, I mean, I'm, I'm saying, well, same sex relationships and oh, such okay. could be a little bit different, but, um, there's a, a phrase that I didn't coin, but I've heard is men are the gas and women are the brakes. <laughs> and the, I, the idea is when someone's in that futurizing mode, okay, it's like the, the line from um, My Fair Lady, you know, words, 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 if you love me, show me. It's going to take time. And so I wouldn't necessarily discount someone if they're in that enthusiastic phase. I certainly would be paying attention do the actions match the words? Well, that's, that's where the problem went sideways. You know, they uh, sh she asked him for exclusivity. He agreed to it. And then the very next week she's saying, oh, but I'm going on vacation with my ex because the tickets were bought. Well, those two things just don't turn out to be very aligned. Well, that, yeah, that one's, to that, that one doesn't make sense to me because no, if they're, it's a that, red flag, right? yeah, well, yeah. And that's, that to me is probably even leaning on a deal breaker, you know, from one perspective, because if you've, if that's still, if that X is still that active in your life, I don't care about what tickets you got. You know, I certainly wouldn't want to be a man dating a woman who's still spending time with their ex in that capacity. Well, I that's said a deal clearly, breaker to me. <laughs> I mean, well, just think about it from this point of view, not to belabor the point, but to help yeah. people who are listening, who have been in and, and are now out of a toxic relationship. If somebody asks you to be exclusive with the knowledge that they have tickets to go away with their ex next week, yes, that is a big conflict of interest, a conflict of uh, the beginning of a relationship that you can trust because at a minimum, that person should have been smart enough to go away with the ex and wait a couple of weeks and then talk about exclusivity. <laughs> exactly. Right? And right. by the way, here's the thing about exclusivity. A lot of times, even that word can be a bit pretty charged. So I like to break it down really simple. I like to think of it as I like to only date one person at a time. That's it. That's what exclusivity is. I only like to date one person at a time. And when I'm intimate, I like to be monogamous. I only like to be sleeping with one person at a time. We don't have to make these. Now, in the case that you shared, I mean, that's ridiculous. And certainly that man had every right to say, 
again, to me, that's a deal breaker, not a red flag. I mean, the red flag means go. <laughs> you don't even need to ask more questions. Okay. So what do you think about people who you meet and you start to talk and you get to that place about talking about previous relationships and you find that they've been married eight times. <laughs> what do you do then? What kind of mental gymnastics should you engage in? And uh, what do you think is the best plan? You know, here's the thing. I don't like to judge someone for their choices. You know, if they've been married eight times, a person could have eight separate relationships in their lifetime that could have lasted three months, six months, one year, five years. So someone actually goes to the extent of making a commitment, I'd certainly want to find out why all those relationships ended. <laughs> I'd certainly be curious. I'd also even invite to learn what they, ask them what they learned about themselves in each one of those relationships. That's actually one of my favorite questions to ask someone. What did you learn about yourself in your past relationships? Because that can reveal volumes depending on how they answer. But I'm, I'm, here's the thing. People get judged all the time. They get judged for never being married. You know, someone can be in their 50s and 60s. What's wrong with them? That sort of thing. They're never married. Or someone who's had multiple marriages. Eight is rare, but certainly two or three is not uncommon. Now, most of the time, these are individuals that haven't done any personal development work, any self-help, spiritual work in their lives. So they're most likely going to be repeating patterns. That's certainly a red flag. But to the person that's aware of this, ask if, if you've done inner work, personal development, self-help, and you're recognizing, and if someone's had those experiences and you find out they've done nothing to heal past those relationships, it might just be, you know, yellow flag or, or not so much red flag, but it might just be caution that you're misaligned as two individuals. It's not a bad thing. It just means you're not aligned. Mm -hmm. And that's the invitation is to ask questions. That's why I'm a big proponent of asking questions where a lot of my contemporaries say, don't ask questions because that's an interrogation. No. How do you get to know another human being without asking them questions? Yes, but you, you might do what I was suggesting earlier, and I think you agree with this. Yes. Is, you know, ask this level of questions, then a deeper level of questions. You know, you don't just jump in and say, okay, you know, in what timeline are you prepared to make a committed relationship? <laughs> you know? That well, that's a hard question to ask someone, but asking about their past, um, you know, reveals volumes. You know, history does kind of tend to repeat themselves. So I'm more about asking you know, here's the thing. I operate a little bit differently. I like asking deeper questions. To me, small talk is boring. It's surface level. When you ask interpersonal questions of another human being, you're actually wanting to get to know them as a, a, a person and not as a status symbol in your Facebook post, you know, yeah, but <laughs> relationship let me, ask, let me ask a question about that, Jonathan, because I think that there's a factor, and I tell my folks this factor, that uh, give someone, a, if you're attracted to the person, yeah. you know, generally, give them two or three times to show you who they are because there is stress and anxiety involved. You can come off really badly. I have a friend who has spent a fortune on matchmaking and all that kind of thing. And you know, every time she tells me about meeting somebody, it comes down to this. She will say, well, I don't know what that agency was thinking. I clearly said they had to be over six feet tall. Like, mm. bam, gone, yeah. <laughs> right? But there is anxiety involved. And as I was saying to her, it doesn't matter if they're six feet tall, five foot 10, they're still taller than you. Why is it that you're interjecting this standard that allows you not to get to know people? And there's so much that we can talk about and we don't have all kinds of time to talk about it. But I do want to put a caveat in here. If you have yeah. been with a hijackal, with a toxic person, and you hear that this person has been in relationship or married, it doesn't matter these days, whichever it is, they have, they have many long-term relationships or th two or three year relationships and, mm -hmm. and they have left. Sometimes you will do that just as you said, because you haven't done your own inner work. But I would add this, that 
If you were raised in a home where there was a hijackal parent, narcissistic, antisocial, borderline, whatever, or even non-diagnosable, but with hijackal traits, patterns, and cycles, you will be attracted to that energy until you do the work. Yeah. And that the energy of a hijacker will be attracted to you because you look like prey and it might be an easy supply fix. So it's very important. So before we go, I would just like to ask you this question. Let me make sure that I get it because I have so many. Um, this whole business about people who have been divorced. Yeah. So what's a question a woman should ask a divorced man that would, you know, just that one great question that they could ask someone who's maybe been divorced a couple of times. Do you have an insightful question that would get to the core of something like that? Yeah. Um, well, actually, I shared it already. One of my favorite questions to ask someone is, what did you learn about yourself in your past relationships? And, and, and I also... Um, I'm going to put a little extra caveat on this. When you're asking about past relationships, this is the time to be hyper listening. Because what you're looking for when you're asking someone about past relationship or asking what they learn is what energy are they coming from? Are they coming from victim consciousness? Uh -huh. It was the other person's fault versus, you know what? My marriage and my ex, my ex and I, you know, we reached a point where we no longer, you know, we're in love with each other. I take responsibility for my part. She took responsibility for her part. And it was, and it was a, you know, it was a fairly amicable divorce. In other words, what you're looking for though, and I just shared a very, you know, not nice way, but a very healthy way of describing the end of a relationship. If they're coming at it from a place of, I was a victim, they did this to me, I was with a hijackal and all this stuff, and they're not taking any part in their choices, the red flag is that they may not have healed. And, do you, and you don't wanna be that person that they're gonna go through that healing process with and the relationship with you so they can be off with someone else. Or at least that's my recommendation anyway. I like it. <laughs> I think it is a very good recommendation. And you know, my guest today is Jonathan Asley, and you spell that J O N A T H O N A S L A Y. And you find him at jonathanasley.com. Now remember that O is not it's not usual. <laughs> J O H N A T H O N and the last name is A-S-L-A-Y dot com. And he has a gift for you. He has a chapter from his book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyways? And you can get that at jonathanasley.com slash love. So if you're intrigued by this conversation, you want to go further and go and get this free chapter of his book. So Jonathan, I think we could talk for hours, maybe not a hundred, but we could talk <laughs> for hours. I want to thank you so much for being a guest today on Transforming Relationship with Emotional Savvy. Roberta, thank you so much. Honored to be your guest. So everybody, if you're interested in learning more about Jonathan, go to Jonathan, with an O, Asley.com. And if I can help you in any way, or you're ready to have a consultation, go to transformingrelationship.com. Or if you are right ready to use my new client one hour session for only $97, go to beaclient.com. As usual, we'll have another exciting expert to talk next week. And I look forward to talking with you then. Take good care because you're precious. Thanks for being here for today's episode of Emotional Savvy. If you want to deepen your emotional savvy, make shifts in your relationships, and enjoy life and relationships more, work with me, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Get my books, enjoy my courses, or work with me directly. You can do that by visiting forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, and subscribe to Tips for Relationships now. Don't miss a thing. Be empowered this week with more emotional savvy.